My name is Lou Lefton. I'm a faculty member in the School of Math, uh, assistant dean for IT, and a, a very proud MC for this evening's uh, activities. What we're going to be doing tonight is learning uh, about things that you guys have been doing since the very first day of your life, which is peeing. How many people in favor of that urination? You're in the right place. Oh, they're going to get worse. Uh, this is a physics talk, so I'd like to just see if you guys understand basic hyperbolic equations. Let's see, can we do the wave? Everybody start the wave. Right here, go. Woo! Okay, reflective boundary conditions. Ready? Wave, then bounce back and forth. Ready? Go. They reflect. Pretty good, pretty good. All right. Now we're going to do it on a Klein bottle, so the people in the top corner, when you're done, these people in the bottom corner have to go. Ready? No, we're not going to do the wave on a Mobius strip. Not today. It's on non-orientable manifold. Are you crazy? What we're going to do, though, is uh, talk about, uh, well, one other thing, real quick. Uh, we have a special guest here at the Ig Nobel Ceremony. We have Schrodinger's cat, ladies and gentlemen. Schrodinger's cat joining us, yes. Thank you, Schrodinger's cat. Oh, let's, uh... <laughs> We're going to pass on Schrodinger's cat. Um, actually, uh, I want you all to know that, um, you know, De Dr. Who, we're, we're really happy to have him here. You know, he's, he's, he's a brilliant mathematician, a physicist, an engineer. He got his bachelor's at MIT, uh, his PhD there. He worked at Courant Institute for a while before coming to Georgia Tech in 2005. A very distinguished scientist. And uh, he will be demonstrating none of that tonight, but don't worry. <laughs> No, he's, uh, actually, you know, he, his research inspired my own, I, I did a little of my own research on urination. I, I, uh, I discovered that um, actually when using the urinal, 33% of men hold their penis in their left hand and 67% hold it in their right hand. And 89% wonder why I'm in the bathroom watching them pee with a clipboard. <laughs> it's the other 11% that's really got me concerned. But, uh, you know, it's Skiles, so everything goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, man. We're in Skiles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, the, the big result, the big result that made it all around the world, the physics that everybody's talking about is 20 seconds, 21 seconds, plus or minus to P. Unless, of course, you're my colleague, Dr. Pete Lodovis, uh, who uh, <laughs> seems to make that just stretch into a lifetime. I don't know what it is about you middle-aged guys, Pete, but... Um, See, I told you the prostate jokes weren't going to fly with this crowd. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, yeah, you know, I, the fact that all mammals take approximately the same amount of time to pee is the number one law of urination. Thank you. Thank you. The number two law, of course, is much smellier and not as consistent and uh, law largely dependent on the consumption of legumes, but uh, we're not going to be talking about that tonight. Um, I do want to tell you a little bit about uh, the the... The Ig, no Ig Nobel Prize, uh, uh, you guys, this is the very first Nobel Prize that Georgia Tech has won. Is that right, Prateran? Uh Ig or not, this is our first, so you guys are really at a, histor a historic moment here. Um, you know, uh, and, and as a mathematician, we don't get a Nobel Prize. We have the Fields Medal. It's like this sort of ugly stepsister to the Nobel Prize, equally prestigious, and yet nobody really knows about her. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about that, of course, is that you know, there's, there's a great deal of famous mathematicians who come through campus that have won Fields Medals. There's a great many Nobel Prize winners that you have an opportunity to see as a student or a faculty member or staff here at Georgia Tech. So I'm glad that you guys are all here taking advantage of this historic moment. Um, I, uh, I have actually one of my, do my daughter, I don't think she's in the audience, is Natalie here? No, I didn't think so. I have, I have I actually have, I have a daughter who's attending Georgia Tech. She's a twin. My, my wife and I, we had our first child, and then we had twins, and then we had to stop because we weren't sure whether it was an arithmetic or a geometric progression. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we're going to tr start our, our, our talk here with a, a tradition that is uh, very commonly used at the Ig Nobel ceremonies, which is the flight of the paper airplanes. And we have here Predrag Sadanovich. Let's hit my hand, yes! I, I, I have to give you a little background. The tradition with Ig Nobel is that stage has Nobel Prize people on it. 
Now, at Georgia Tech, we have a number of people like myself. They get so-called WF Nobel Prize. And the way this works, and uh, the two other winners are not here. I don't know why they didn't come tonight. But uh, the way it works is you say, you know that Shmuel Mirovitz is waiting for his Nobel Prize, my faculty member. And the answer is always the same. What for? So that's what we have here. I'm one of the winners of what for Nobel Prize. You probably don't know why I have it. And uh, part of uh, ignoble tradition is that you get a chance to fly a paper airplane at ignoble, uh, noble aspirants. So here we are. Here we go. Ready? Aim. <laughs> fly! Woo! <laughs> Well done. We had an engineering school, I can yeah, tell. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is not Harvard. <laughs> Fantastic. They keep coming. All right. So now, I have to tell you, ooh. <laughs> These planes are very valuable. So what you do is, before you leave, you take one with you. Remember that. Or else we'll have to sweep them up, and that doesn't work on carpet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and take them apart for our guest of honor tonight, the one and only Dr. David Hu. You got your mic on? Thanks, thanks, Lou. I expected about three people to show up today. <laughs> But I'm so glad everyone came. That's the first joke. No, just, OK. So today I want to talk about um, some of the research my lab does um, from the perspective of science humor. And um, so I, actually, I want to dedicate this lecture to um, so Steve Vogel. He was uh, my mentor. He's a 75 years old biology professor at Duke University. He and I bunked together, well, not in the same bed, in the same cabin, in Taiwan for a biomechanics workshop when I was just when I was just 20, 25, so very young, and I met my grad, my first, I met Patricia there, who did the work on urination. This is Patricia. Woo. And um, I learned this week that um, well, he has terminal cancer. And so um, I actually today, while preparing this lecture, I bought a plane ticket to go see him tomorrow because this will be his, this will be probably be his last week to live. Um, but this lecture is dedicated to him, and um, he. He's infamous in the biology community for going around kind of like um, Lou did with these urinals and looking at, <laughs> looking at uh, people urinating. And um, he, he, he hypothesized that basically we have a very small, oh, do we, uh, this pointer doesn't work. We have a very small um, sort of bolus of open ca a cavity at the end of our penis that allows fluid to come out at very long distances without um, becoming turbulent. That was his hypothesis. Um, So the, uh, my first foray into scientific um, literature and scientific humor started with looking at how insects can walk and make love on the water surface. Um, in grad school, we basically built these um, small mechanical devices called robo striders. They're about the size of your hand, and they weigh a third of a gram. And they use the same principle as water striders to walk on water. And uh, we showed that water starters, they have to have, a, they actually have a lot of safety factor in order to prevent from sinking. And in fact, the largest water starter in the world is this giant <coughs> Vietnamese water starter. It's this big, it's this big. And it has a factor of safety of exactly two to allow things like this. Without mating, there could be no water starters. So who's an undergraduate? <laughs> OK, undergraduates. So when I started science, I didn't, there's no way I think I would win a Nobel Prize or continue doing science professionally. So I started out just like you, kind of insecure, uh, incompetent. I'm still incompetent. <laughs> and now I lead a lab that's basically in this front two rows because I made them come. <laughs> I, actually, they didn't know they had to come. Then I told them, if you don't come, you'll hurt my feelings. So, so they're here. And I lead this lab. And for the last 10 years, we were working on um, fluid mechanics research, 
research about how animals use fluids to survive. And um, we've, had a lot, we've had a lot of fun. And the, so the first thing I want to, I actually want to talk a little bit about science. The first thing I want to say is that science is actually a pretty good job. Um, I've had lots of fun doing it. Very few jobs in the world could you actually publish real scientific papers, throw paper airplanes, and show pictures of penises, <laughs> and it still be called science. But science is one of the few things that combines them all. <laughs> it's, in fact, the fifth, um, the fifth or sixth most um, highly rated job for happiness in the world. This is a um, survey from the UK. The top happiest job is floristry and gardening and hairdressing. And then, and then we have uh, a couple of things, and then it's uh, plumbing, marketing, and then finally scientific research has a, it says like a 69% satisfaction rating. So the only way you can beat that is if you become a hairdresser and a scientist together. <laughs> it's really, really high up there, and I can contest that. But the big problem is, and maybe this is not clear to you at Georgia Tech, but America is basically flunking science. We are ranked number 27 of all the countries in the world. So the countries that are ahead of us in math, and science in high school are, um, I can just list them, South Korea, Macau, Japan, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Netherlands, Estonia, Finland, Poland, Canada, Belgium, Germany, Vietnam, Austria, Australia, Iceland, Slovenia. And we're all the way down here for math and science. So we do not train our students very well in high school. And we can, it's hard for them to get motivated. Another problem with science is that scientists cannot communicate the basic things that they want to communicate to the public. We basically have huge gaps between what scientists believe, for example, that eating, non eating genetically modified foods is good for you and not good for you. We totally disagree on these things. The favor and use of animals, safe to eat foods grown with pesticides, the fact that evolution has occurred, um, climate change. 90% of scientists believe in climate change um, caused by human activity, whereas only 50% of the public. So we have a long way to go for scientists to communicate things to the public. So how, how can we do this? How can we solve these tasks of science education and science publicization? Um, and how can we do it cheaply? Because as you know, this is the cost of um, college tuition. It's going, like, it's going basically so fast that in about 18 years, if anyone has, is, um, has young children, that college tuition is going to cost $130,000 a year. For one year of college, that's how much it's going to cost to educate a 21-year-old. And textbook prices, because professors, um, because these companies have just taken advantage of academics, they've grown over a thousand percent. They've grown, this is almost three times as quickly as everything else you can buy in the supermarket, textbooks. So it seems like science is a very expensive activity. How can we help people do things, learn science, like science, cheaply? So these are all really hard questions. And, um, I actually have no idea how to answer them. You thought I was going to answer them by leading them all to this. I have no idea how to answer them. <laughs> um, but I do know one thing that can't hurt that everyone can participate in. And that's science humor. So what is science humor? This is the only award that celebrates science humor in the world. So I'll list three of my favorites. Um, so the Psychology Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize back in 2011, was given for showing that leaning to the left makes the Eiffel Tower seem smaller. <laughs> so I actually read this paper, and it goes into deep psychology that inside our brain is an abstract number line. And we have small numbers on the left and big numbers on the right. So if you lean your head to the left, you are automatically putting yourself into looking at basically the small parts of the number, number line. And this is data to prove it. These are basically the heights of what people thought the Eiffel Tower is, leaning to the left, middle, and to the right, middle, and to the left. This is real. This is real. <laughs> this is real. It won an Ig Nobel Prize. OK. Next example. This was the prize from last year um, for trying to understand what happens in the brains of people who see the face of Jesus in a piece of toast. This is an actual psychology study, and that showed that basically we have, we have visual, visual neurons that detect patterns, and that we can't stop them. They're part of our overactive imagination. And that's how we see you know, random uh, animals and clouds. Those definitely are not there. If you actually see Jesus here 
it's because you have, a, you have this imagination, and it's part of being human. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. <coughs> All right. So this Ig Nobel Prize was for the first person to use 10,000 refrigerator magnets. It's this very expensive um, electromagnet device in the UK to levitate to levitate a frog. Yes, so this uses the principle of diamagnetism. All of you are composed of 70% water. And, and with a strong enough magnet, those water molecules will, will polarize so that they become magnetic. So with 10,000 little refrigerator magnets, they took this poor frog and were able to let it float. And you can see it wasn't, it wasn't very happy. And you can, it was the first demonstration of this principle for animate objects. They had used it for strawberries and water before. And as part of this guy, Andrew Gimes, um, he has this activity called Friday Evening Experiments, where basically every Friday evening, his group just does something crazy. And uh, three results have come out of those Friday Evening Experiments. One of them was levitation of frog. The other one was the Nobel Prize for discovering you can create single molecule layers of graphene, carbon, using tape and pencil. He literally took tape and a pencil and he pulled it off and he found the single layer that he generated was higher precision than the thousands of dollars they had used to use these devices. Friday evening experiments. So what, those are three examples of what I think science humor is. And you know, Mark Abrams, he's the person that started this prize out of nothing. 24 years ago, he, he came up to this audience of science writers, he said, I want to start a new category called science humor. And people were, looked at him and said, what? Science humor? Science is not supposed to be funny. We're supposed to trust scientists. Science is the intellectual practice and activity of encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Humor is the quality of being amusing on purpose. Science humor, how can we combine that? So everyone just laughed him off, and that was 24 years ago. And since then, he started this Ignoble Prize with almost no money, no support, into the only award for science humor, for pe making people laugh and then think. That's what he started. And how much support did he get? Well, every year he gets six Nobel laureates to come to the ceremony. I don't know, so I've met a couple of Nobel laureates over the years when I give talks, and they generally charge something on the order of $10,000 per appearance. And they can, because there's only so many, a finite number of living Nobel laureates in the world at any given time. They're traveling all over the world. They, I've met this guy in, uh, in China. He had this suitcase. He said, this is my clothes for a month. I'm going to use this to travel all over the world and give these talks. So they are overbooked, booked, booked years in advance. But for science humor, six Nobel laureates um, donate their time. Why is it so important for Nobel laureates to be at this Ig Nobel Prize? Well, one you just saw, the Ig Nobel Prize gets messy. And we need janitors. These are the highest paid, highest qualified janitors in the world. And they're happy to do it at the Ig Nobel Prize. And by the way, I'm going to need some help cleaning up these paper airplanes at the end. <laughs> All right. So that's the Ig Nobel Prize. And how did I get involved with the Ig Nobel Prize? So I didn't know about this prize. All I did, I've been doing is doing research that I find fun. And um, I'm going to give you two case studies that are actually published this year of research that I just started, kind of like the Friday evening experiments, um, but um, that have led to unexpected places. So the first study I want to talk about is eyelashes. So I'm the, I'm the proud parent of um, two um, disgusting little children. <laughs> and you won't understand what that means until you have children, but they eat their boogers, you know, they poop all over the place. It's like having a zoo in your living room. And um, I have a daughter, and I noticed um, when she was born that she looked exactly like her father-in-law. <laughs> uh, no, my father-in-law. She looked exactly like. <laughs> I haven't met him. She looks exactly like this old 65-year-old Chinese guy from Chengdu. <laughs> anyway, but I also noticed that she had really long eyelashes. And I thought that was very strange because well, when girls are born, people expect them to come out like floral and just beautiful, but she was all swollen up, had zero hair over her entire body, totally bald, and but she had these huge, long eyelashes. Why? Why does she have such long eyelashes when she didn't have hair anywhere else? So I've, 
I have this ceremony with my grad students. I'll meet them, and I'll ask them to do the craziest project ever. And I met this guy, Guillermo Amador. And um, uh, he saw some of our work in National Geographic. He's from, originally from Venezuela. He was placed second play, place in this Red Bull flug tag competition, where they actually try to fire these airplanes off these small piers, which will eventually fall into water. And he was the one of the three grad students who had said yes, that I'm going to, I will study eyelashes for my mechanical engineering PhD. <laughs> I will study eyelashes for my mechanical engineering PhD. That's what he said. Well, he just said yes, but I filled in the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so he built this small wind tunnel in that I'm going to talk about in a second. And so Guillermo is the only graduate student probably in the world, definitely at Georgia Tech, that has published his research in New York Times, The Economist, and Cosmo. I don't know how many of you guys actually look at Cosmo, but there's some really weird stuff in here. <laughs> and it's always about sex. Every issue is about sex and eyelashes. So I'm very happy that we were able to appear in Cosmo. And so this magazine's crazy. Yeah, the magazine's crazy. So Guillermo found a Pura student. Has anyone done Pura before, President's Undergrad Research Award? Well, it's basically a license for you to do crazy research. The president gives you $1,500, you just write two pages about it. And we wrote two pages about going to the American Museum of Natural History, sending um, this poor Peter Mercutio, um, this guy from my fluid mechanics class, and if they're in my class, they say yes to everything, because they think I'll give them an A. <laughs> I convinced him to go to this abandoned, well, basically the basement of this museum, and to look at all the dead animals and all the, the basic carcasses and measure every single eyelash that he saw. Yeah. And he said he almost drove him crazy to be in this dark room for an entire week, but he came back with this data. He came back with this data and he said, there's something unexpected that all these eyelashes follow a magic rule. They are all the same length. Each eyelash from the Amur hedgehog to the Norman uh, anteater, all the way to armadillos, opossums, rabbits, lemurs, pandas, badgers, jaguarundas, chimpanzees, camels, leopards, cougars, tapirs, dogs, boars, and giraffes, those eyelashes are of a length one-third the eye width. These animals are all from all over the place, and biologists would have just gone crazy because you're not supposed to see this. Genetically, they're totally diverse. Giraffes are nowhere near cougars, which are definitely nowhere pandas. You know, pandas in Chinese is xiong mao, which means bear cat. <laughs> definitely nowhere near cats or bears, but they all fall along the same length. There's a magic rule. And so we, stuck, we sat with this data for basically an entire year until we finally figured out how to understand why this is the case. So why it's the case deals with fluid mechanics. And Guillermo built a basically a very low speed wind tunnel, totally different from the kind you find in the aeronautics building, but a wind tunnel that blows at the speeds that these animals walk, centimeters per second. And he built fake eyelashes of various lengths to test the hypothesis that different lengths of eyelashes will affect how much your eye evaporates. And then we use these human eyelashes as well as we basically use these meshes, which have the same effect of allowing pores, providing a pore surface, allowing air to flow through, but still be affected by their length. And then what he found, and he also compared it to basically this cardboard tube. So if I were to walk around like this, well, you'd think I'm kind of crazy, but if I were walking around with binoculars, that's basically what we'd, this would be like. And the binocular case is quite simple. Basically, as it gets longer and longer, it shields the eye more and more. So that basically, um, the longer it is, the less evaporation you have. That's, that's obvious, because it, it, it shields the air. Now, the strange thing is that the eyelashes, the mesh, showed an optimum, a local minimum at about one third. The same magic length that we measured previously was the minimum the least evaporation, and it was a factor of two. So if you had eyelashes, your eyes evaporated twice as slowly than if you didn't. Twice as slowly than you didn't, or twice as slowly as if you had eyelashes that were extra, extra long, like in Cosmo. <laughs> why in the world, why in the world would that happen? How could eyelash length affect how much your eye evaporates? That's the wonderful thing about the field that I, cho that I chose, fluid mechanics. It makes the invisible visible. All around you, there's actually heat dissipating, like from this guy's head, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, OK, well, anyway, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. But basically, all around us, we have heat leaving our bodies. And if you actually use one of these Schlieren devices, you would see all the wonderful flows that are around us 
that are just invisible because they're in thin air. So this is actually just a, it's a Schlieren. It's a, it's a mirror with a very sharp razor blade that basically allows us to see how density changes in the fluid. Now the eyelashes use a principle called boundary layers. They're this idea that when fluid hits objects, they slow down. And you would think that they would slow down far away from objects. But in reality, they flow down really, really close to objects in a very thin layer called the boundary layer. And, and the eyelashes extend this boundary layer longer than you would think. Basically, when you have this eyelash, it creates a little bump. Air wants to come in and it wants to turn around. And when, when you have short eyelashes, the bump prevents, allows the air to turn around a little earlier. So the, long, the taller the bump is, the, the more the air turns before it hits your eye, effectively creating a stagnant zone in front of your eye. But this effect doesn't go on forever. If your eyelashes are too long, it'll actually extend into the flow and funnel air in. It's like a little signpost that says, follow me, and it'll actually hit your eye even harder. So the eye has to grow a length that um, allows the speed bump effect to occur without the funneling. And that's what the magical eyelash length is. And um, I think the news source that summarizes best is this, um, the trusted news source that is um, Saturday Night Live. Buddy from high school, Ridley. Yeah, it's Ridley, baby. <laughs> I told you last time, please don't bother me when I'm working, man. Oh, well, so now I'm bothering you whilst you are working? Because it looks like you're just sitting, Jay. I am not just sitting, I am working hard. Oh, please. I work at Friendly's, boo. And I run their store wars trivia night. So that means, what does that mean? I don't work hard? I'm confused. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. You don't work hard. This is not easy, Ripley. Oh, oh, but Michael, it is, baby. <laughs> Even Ripley can do your job. Check, to check, to check it out. A new study shows that humans have long eyelashes to keep their eyes from drying out, while a similar study shows that humans have fake eyelashes to let you know they nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> so that's uh, from Georgia Tech to Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and honestly, that's pretty typical. 90% just funny random crap and then 10% science. But without the funny random crap, people wouldn't be li listening to that 10%. So people are watching Saturday Night Live and they're learning science. That's what we're getting. So, and it's not just evaporation Guillermo found with this one tunnel. He also found it also delayed the deposition of particles. And this is an open scientific problem. How do we build devices that don't collect particles? Devices that we can't clean easily, like the surface of our eye. We don't exactly want to go in there with a windshield wiper. And this is exactly the case of the Mars rover, Curiosity. It's a rover that is the only one on Mars, and it walks around in a dusty environment. So over a period of months, it actually had its solar panels completely covered in dust. And without these self-cleaning properties, it actually just sat there waiting for the wind to blow it off. So if all this month it could be collecting data, it was just sitting there. So maybe one day we'll actually use this um, these idea of eyelashes, small fibers that protrude just like our eye without, pen without pe providing um, light to, boun to bounce off, but allowing uh, air to come off and clean it. I think that's the future. All right. I know you've all been waiting for me to talk about urine, which is usually not the case when I give a scientific talk. So none of this would be possible without Miss Patricia Yang. She's sitting right here. So I couldn't have guessed she would have joined my lab because she won first place in the head pomelo competition, which is the basically, the, I guess you had to walk around with this thing on your head without it falling off. And she was the first person to say, yes, I will study urine for my PhD. So why in the world is this even a scientific problem? Like why, how in the world is this science? All science starts with a question. 
and a question that no one can answer until they do this experiment. How does urination change duration change with animal size? So now this, why I started this study, the previous one was with my daughter, and this one was even before when I was actually dating my wife, who I met when I was a assistant professor here. So I met her, I met her on Match.com, actually. <laughs> and um, so she had this poodle from her ex-boyfriend, this poodle, I just totally hated this poodle. She's hanging out with her and basically acting like her guardian, acting like her little her boyfriend or anything. I was so annoyed at this poodle. And I would take it for walks daily because I had to. <laughs> so I noticed this, so this poodle is about five kilograms. So this is a fat poodle, okay, 10 pounds, <laughs> fat poodle. But even a five kilogram poodle has a bladder about this big. It's like someone's drink. Anyone drinking anything here? Yeah, about like, like this. Imagine this for poodle urine, this big. A cup, a cup of poodle urine. And now I, th I, was, I was watching this animal urinate, and I was thinking, man, it really takes its time. It could be worse, I guess. What if, what if my wife's ex-boyfriend gave her an elephant? That is a th an elephant is a thousand poodles. I don't know if you've ever been to the zoo, but elephants are really big, and they're even bigger when you go up close. 5,000 poodles. Oh, sorry, 1,000, 1,000 poodles. It's still a lot of poodles, a lot of poodles. And as a consequence, so urine is generated from urea, which is a byproduct of um, metabolism. And so the amount, the volume of your blood um, will force you to have more urine. So in fact, an elephant, and we did this at the zoo, has about 20 liters of urine every time. That's a kitchen garbage can. And that's not like, you know, freshman kitchen, maybe, well, okay, freshman kitchen, it's huge. You got all these beer bottles, all this like <laughs> random stuff that you tried to cook. 20 liters, it's almost, a, it's almost, a hundred times what the poodle has because it weighs a thousand times more. So it's like a little fire truck, a device that has to release fluid that's a hundred times more. And so how much time does the poodle take? Just yell it out. 20 About 20 seconds. Okay, this was better before I won the Ignoble Prize because now everyone knows. But the amazing thing about the elephant is that you'd expect it to take 10 times more, but it took about the same. A hundred times more fluid coming out at the same time how is that even possible? How is that even possible? That's what we want to find out. <laughs> President's Undergraduate Research Award. This is what you want to win. Then you can join, th join these folks. I have to say, I've had four pre-meds in my lab over the years who, again, pre-meds will do anything that you ask because they want to go to medical school, because they want to go to medical school. And, and the other thing is I've gotten all of them into medical school and one of them to be a urologist using this project. So that's his, that's his um, boxer shorts poking out, actually. <laughs> OK. So now the interesting thing about undergrad research is you have to be really scrappy. You've got to come up with stuff. I mean, you don't have much time with a professor. You have to basically come up with ways to satisfy these demands of measure, getting this data. So how did, how did they do this? So they went to the zoo. And um, I, told, I told them, go to the zoo, bring this bucket. Hey, bring this camera and this stopwatch. And don't come back until you've measured all the animals in the zoo, all their pee pee times. Don't come back. I want to know all the pee-pee times, <laughs> all of them. And so the funny thing, has any, raise your hand if you've seen a rat urinate. <laughs> you sick puppy. <laughs> OK. The reason you, you probably haven't is because they urinate in fractions of a second. They cannot kind of generate jets. They urine like a little bullet. Pew, pew. It really makes those sounds, too, pew, like lasers. You can hardly see it, <laughs> fractions of a second and it's gone, 0.1 milliliters. Okay, dogs. Now the problem is dogs are pretty smart. They don't like it when you take a, like a kitchen saucepan and go follow them under their, <laughs> under their genitals. They just think it's weird. <laughs> they just look at you. So they, we, we tried this, they're like, you know, they're, the dogs are not liking it. And then I said, bring the house training pads, these absorbent mats for house training, and we will weigh the mats. And urine is the density of water, and we will find the volume that way. We will weigh, weigh these disgusting, urine-scoped mats for your data. And that's what they did. Cows. Now, the interesting thing about cows, the sad cows spend their entire lives penned in. They have no enjoyment at all, except for the one time every week they do, for their, they do their medical checkups. And that is when the cow, these farmers, palpate their vulvas. <laughs> so to get a how to urinate, you just rub its vulva, 
How, how do you do it, Patricia? Uh, I'm not a person, sorry. Oh, okay. Jonathan, yeah. Okay, well, anyway, they really like it, and then they urinate for you. <laughs> Hey, this lecture is definitely rated PG-13. I hope there's no kids in here. <laughs> all right, and then elephants. Now, this is the hardest of all, because an elephant can kill you without even noticing, <laughs> right? It, it doesn't even notice. And so, and how do you get an elephant to do what you want it to do? The answer is you cannot. <laughs> elephants do whatever the hell they want. And so these zookeepers, they're like, we're like we want the elephant to pee on command. It's like, what, are you joking? <laughs> So we talked to them and they said, okay, well, it is true when they get up in the morning, the first thing they do is pee. So we went early in the morning and if, if, they, don't, if they don't pee, we got this ritual of them doing these exercises. They stand up on these step stools, get back down, stand back up, get back down. If they do enough exercise, then they pee. So with all that basically effort and all these ingenious methods that these undergrads came up with, we came up, we found basically the evolution of the urinary system. So this is probably the first animal on the planet to walk. The mudskipper became a rat. It turned, this is actually what they generate. And it's your worst nightmare. It's like they're on the space station. You try to pee, you get these drops. This is all you get. That's their daily life. There is no rat urinal. It wouldn't work. It just goes everywhere. And this is because at those scales, there's, the surface tension forces are so high, things become spheres. As you get larger, you get animals that appear to be almost similar to us, even though they have no genetic relation, or at least to most of us. Goats and cows. So this cow, so it, gen it generates a huge amount of urine. It's a bucket, a bucket of smell. It smelled pretty bad, I heard. Pretty bad. Okay, it's good to be a professor. I actually wasn't there. <laughs> and then the elephant. <laughs> And when you get lemons, you make lemonade. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. OK. And all this data. So they worked like crazy. So I remember the first day they came back from the zoo, they smelled terrible. They smelled like mud and most of all urine from different animal species. It was like a urine buffet. And this is the data they showed me. They're like, um, maybe we did it wrong, but all of it follows on this line. And that's when I knew this is physics. Physics, when you, when you take an experiment anyone can do, and you get a surprising result. And the only way you can explain it is with math and physics. So this is their body weight, 10, okay, 10 kilograms all the way to 10,000 kilograms, right? This is the three, one, two, three, three orders of magnitude. But the urine is a factor of less of two. It's like it's 10 plus or minus 10. It basically does not scale, it basically stays still. With these really crude experiments, why is that? So the first thing we found out was we went to the literature and the students read about 50 to 100 urinary and veterinary um, ur uh, medical papers. And they found that there was actually tons of literature on how big animals, um, what we call their pee pee pipes are. So an animal's urinary system, and all of you, not just the men, but the women, all of you have a pee pee pipe. This is important because my two kids are just always talking to each other. You don't have PP pipe. I have PP pipe. You have PP pipe. <laughs> but everyone has a PP pipe, men and women. And you have a, basically a bladder. It's a balloon. It's a vesicle to hold fluid. And no one, people have named this, but they have no idea what it is. It's called a urethra. And it turns out it's critical for getting this phenomenon to happen. And for all these animals, a very strange thing is, so urethra has an aspect ratio of about 20. That's about the length of my arm. Um, that is the ratio for all animals, from a mouse to an elephant. So an elephant and a mouse, you can see they look quite different, but inside their bodies, the urinary system has the exact same proportions. Their genetics for the, this, their genes for the urinary system is the same, so that it's just magnified up. But otherwise, it's exactly the same proportions. Totally different from the other systems in your body. Your brain, your lungs, all those change with size, but not the pee pee pipe. Now, where does the fluid mechanics come in? I just taught this. Anyone in my ME 3340 class? Woo! Okay. <laughs> you guys are supposed to do a woo. Do a woo at 3340. Okay. We'll have to work on that. Work on that tomorrow, Wednesday. <laughs> we found, looked in the literature and looked at, so how do, containers drain. 
Well, the interesting thing is it depends on how tall the containers are. And Torricelli, he discovered um, the manometer. He discovered basically how we measure humidity um, almost 400 years ago. And he showed that if you basically put holes in a container at different heights, the holes on the bottom have higher speed. This is called Torricelli's law. And it's basically due to the fact that imagine you're a diver and you're swimming through this bucket of elephant urine. <laughs> and as you swim in the bottom, you feel your ears start to really com compress from the pressure. All this fluid here is supporting the weight of the fluid above. It generates this high pressure. These urine molecules are literally like being forced, forced into each other. And that forces, when you make an orifice, them to come out at high speed. So why do animals urinate for nearly constant of 20 seconds? There are two reasons. The cross-section area and flow speed. So this is a PP pipe. And for most of us, it's about a couple millimeters wide. But if an elephant, it's about this wide. It's like a couple centimeters, right? Mm -hmm. And imagine it's a highway. And the urine molecules are cars. The wider you make the highway, the more you increase the cross-sectional area, the more cars can, can simultaneously go through. Basically, the more lanes you have. So the more flow rate um, can come through, the more volume of urine. And the second fact is more subtle, has to do with this Torricelli's law. That basically, the longer you make this pipe, the faster it goes. So you started with Torricelli, also known as Bernoulli's law, which relates the speed to the height of this container. And keep in mind that this height is not the height of the um, vesicle. It's the height of basically the artificially made height from the urethra. It makes it seem taller than it is, so it can go faster. Um, the time to urinate is the volume of the bladder divided by um, the diameter of the urethra uh, squared times u. This is the volume divided by flow rate. And if you plug in um, these numbers, you get the law of urination. And we have no free coefficients. We just use based on the density of water and the heights from these animals. And we pick the line that's right here. You get exactly the trend that you see. And so these big elephants, the, these big animals, the elephants, they have a huge bladder. But the, but the urethra is wide to allow flow to go through. And it's super tall. And that increases the speed so it all comes out at the same time. And if you don't believe me, you can look at this experiment. There's these urethras underneath. A rhino, a human, and a dog um, bladder. And if you artificially add these urethras, you get abnormally high flow speeds. I should play that again. <laughs> All right. And that's just um, food coloring. It's food coloring, right? It's not real urine. It's food coloring. Okay. So without these urethras, basically make this container seem like it's super tall. And it makes the pressure here abnormally high. So fluid just rushes out of it. OK, and if you still don't believe me, you can watch Discovery Channel, where they've done human trials. That's pretty amazing. I didn't even pay them to do that. <laughs> and if you go home, I guarantee you, all of you go home, you will start counting. You'll be like, is this guy right? Is this guy right? One, two, three. I guarantee you, you will count. And in fact, that's what people have done. This is NPR, um, a Science Friday. And uh, this shows that this has medical implications. So Fahad, I guess um, this guy from Middle East or something, Fahad. He saw this as, I said, I'm sorry to say that this came to me as a shock. Since my average urination time is 60 seconds, and my longest time ever was almost three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. I thought this is common for a lot of people if they drink a lot of liquid until I saw this research. Can somebody tell me if, I have a similar, if they have a similar experience or if I need to see a doctor? So this guy needs to see a prostate doctor. He needs a prostate exam because he pees longer than an elephant. <laughs> and in engineering terms, what we've discovered is what's called a scalable hydrodynamic system. There are a few devices in the world that work equally well no matter how much fluid there is in it. For example, um, water towers. Um, you can imagine these large containers for, um, for beverages, these um, water backpacks. If you use these principles of increasing the length of 
a pipe or a urethra under it, you can get artificially high flow speeds without in the input of energy, just by using this uh, urinary-inspired research. And guess what? For the last 15 minutes, we've actually been doing science. You've learned fluid mechanics. Some of you have learned what volume is, pressure, what boundary layers are, and Torricelli's law. And you've learned biology. And this is basically what is the goal of the next generation of Georgia Tech students. They're, the people in middle school and high school are going to go through what's called next generation science standards, where instead of doing lots and lots of book work, they're going to study a few things that basically combine both fluid mechanics and biology, things that are interdisciplinary. And you've also learned how to do tabletop experiments and doing science with junk, with just random pieces of stuff that you find. This is important not just for kids, but adults too. So this Ig Nobel Prize and the urinary research and the eyelashes have been seen by people all across the world. And there's a ton of people. You know, After you exit college, I gave this lecture in my fluid mechanics class today, but you are in the only period of your life that you have eight hours of education a day. After that, you basically get nothing. You just get what you can find on the internet and the newspaper. And this, in some ways, is for them. This is a way that they can basically you know, stay motivated, learn things, and also keep in touch. So what can you do? So I asked Mark Abrams after I won this award, I was like, what can I do to help? So he says, the first thing you do is tell people about the Ig Nobel Prize. There's still a lot of people you know, outside the nerdy science community that don't know what it is, but could appreciate it. Telling people about the Ig Nobel Prize supports science humor. I remember, with research, it's better to be wrong than to be boring. Um, so the last thing I'll say is I'm, uh, I'll give a plug for my book. So um, after seeing a lot of press, a lot of this press, Princeton University Press has asked me to write a book about the science of animal movement. And it's going to be a book about crazy things that you've probably only heard of. Mud skippers that came from out of water and actually walk on land that evolved into all the vertebrate life on land. Elephants that cannot only walk, but maybe they can run. Flying snakes, snakes that literally fly from tree to tree. Um, flies that basically just get the way, out of the way of your swatter when you try to swat them. Mike the Headless Chicken. I don't know if you heard this, but there's been a chicken that had, in the 50s that walked around with no head for two years. And it shows the concept of central pattern generator, this idea that all of our locomotions created from the brain that is your spinal cord. It doesn't actually need a brain, so it couldn't see, it couldn't eat. They fed little food down its little gullet. And it lived for two years. And Robo Cheetah. Um, so with that, I'm happy to open the floor for any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. That was an incredible uh, experience. Uh, before you guys all go out and pee, you need to ask some questions, right? I'm sure there must be a few Q&A in the audience. If you have your question, raise a hand. Dr. Greco or myself will bring you a mic. So uh, p uh, thank you, very, uh, very cool presentation. Um, people make a decision how long to hold their bladder given circumstances. Do you find that many animals are doing this, or is it more normal for them to have a more consistent duration of urina urination? We've, this is actually a real question. I expected something really silly. <laughs> so I had the silly side of my brain on, but now I'm going to the scientist side. So, I mean, no one actually knew, know, knows why animals urinate and when. So this research found that when we compared the volumes that we collected, that animals generally urinate when their bladder is about 2 thirds full. That represents, represents their factor of safety. Um, the bladder, it is elastic, but it does have a limit. And basically, they tend to urinate when it's about 2 thirds full. I think if, it urinates, if they urinate more often than that, they're kind of wasting time. If they wait till the last minute, then they're probably a Georgia Tech student taking a test. <laughs> um, but it's about 2 thirds full. And, now, that's one of the important things about this data. We did not try to keep it you know, super precise. We didn't have any constraints. We just said, any animal you see, go measure it. And then, I mean, a, bio, a, a person might think that that's terrible protocol, but end up getting enough data for this paper. And so it goes to show you that basically the amount of urine in these systems really doesn't affect the time. Another question? Down here? Uh, one back. 
So is uh, urination uh, uh, turbulent or laminar flow? Oh, the question is, is urination turbulent or laminar flow? So laminar flow is um, basically slow flow, where basically every streamline just follows like a path, like fingers on a chalkboard. Turbulent flow is when you get chaotic things that you can't predict. <clears throat> we used a model for laminar flow, um, but in actuality, it's probably turbulent. And so it might explain, we have a mysterious factor of three. So through all these calculations, we could only predict that animals could, should take about eight seconds and that it should be constant. We can't understand why it actually takes them 20. And um, it's very surprising. So it might have to do that there are actually very small vortices and things in, in, in the urinary system. So no one actually knows the answer to that, que uh, the answer to that question. Um, it's very hard to basically do an experiment with a live animal and looking at its flow in its urine, in its penis, under an x-ray, and everything. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no one actually knows the answer to that, answer that question. Preach, brother. Uh, another one. <laughs> Oh, thanks for a great lecture. Um, so with your students watching these animals, do you think their behavior might have changed a little bit compared to if they were just somewhere in the wilderness, nobody's watching them, and therefore <laughs> they could urinate at a different rate or something? Oh, is this Heidenberg's urinary Heisenberg's principle? Heisenberg's pee-shy I'm watching them. <laughs> when I watch you urinate, do you do it differently? <laughs> oh, I would hope so. I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Much more quickly. Otherwise, I'd have to pay or something. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, all these animals are in captivity. Um, we measured 40 different animals, and they all, they all follow along, uh, along the trend, um, even dogs and cats. Um, and uh, it's actually not easy to urinate slower. I don't know if you, ever, you can try this at home, but you can't be like, I'm going to urinate really slowly today, like three minutes long. I, it just doesn't. It just, it, we have very... We have basically on or off switch on, on the bladder. We can push it faster, but it's hard to make it, make it slower. Um, Ed, you got one there? And then I have one up here. I was, I was wondering about the. Where's the, where's the, can you raise your, oh, there you are, okay. The smaller animals that didn't fit with the flow because of the droplets instead. Oh, right. Um, so let's, this is the, um, they are the, okay, here, this they are. All laws have limits. The law of urination's limit is about my wife's poodle. It's about here. <laughs> Other animals seem to have their own trend. Um, so we actually got their bats that are studied at Brown University, um, and then rats and mice, and we measured all their urination times, and those are all quite short. So for those animals, basically there's, there's this idea of um, gravity, and it only is important when you're big. And gravity is what's driving, there are two forces driving the flow, bladder pressure, um, squeezing it, and mostly gravity, especially for the large animals. And these animals, they're basically urinating on the realm outside of gravity because the gravity forces are so small in comparison to the other forces that resist the flow. So them urinating is like us trying to, I don't know if you've ever um, tried to drink f water out of a coffee stirrer, it's really hard. Um, and those live in that regime where the viscous forces, the properties of the wall actually affect them and make them um, urinate so slowly that they can't even generate a jet. Instead, they just generate these small drops. And they're a consequence of their own body size. And in fact, in this regime, there's this prediction we have for the smallest animal that can urinate because of these forces that prevent them from flowing. And it's about the size of a small mouse. And in fact, when mice are born, they can't urinate on their own. They have to, they have to be um, licked by their, by their mother. So this mother mouth actually has to lick their urethra. Otherwise, they basically can't urinate. And it might be because they've basically gone past the minimum law of biophysics. Well, that's going to stick with me all night. Thanks. Um, <laughs> no. We've got another question here. All right. Uh, about how long did it take from first asking this Friday night experiment to actually publishing the paper? Oh, how can I actually uh, make this useful? The Friday night experiment, how long did it take? So. Uh, actually, I don't have a slide that addresses this. I don't know why I'm going back. <laughs> okay, here, I'll just end, put it here because it's funny. <laughs> All right. So the, f um, uh, maybe a, a year or two, a year. Um, but it wasn't, this is not the type of thing we sort of stayed up all night on. It was, um, it was a, we just sort of did in our spare time. And it was a matter of finding the right student. 
So I asked quite a few people, does anyone want to go to the zoo and collect urine in buckets? And for some strange reason, most people said no. <laughs> so the first thing was getting like, you know, the pre-meds, the people interested enough to actually get this data. Um, so it took about two years, but it all started with a hunch. And honestly, I knew that this was a publishable paper and that, well, I didn't think so many people would see this, but I knew that this was publishable as soon as they brought back the elephant data. As soon as this elephant did not take like five minutes to urinate, I knew this was going to be big, as big as an elephant's piece of dung. <laughs> that big. I knew it was going to be big because it was surprising. And everyone I talked to, I went to conferences. I asked them, hey, how long does an, does an elephant urinate? And they look at me like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> this is a fluid mechanics conference. But I was like, no, seriously, how long does it take? They'd be like, five minutes. So as soon as I had talked to these people, I knew no one knew the answer. Then I knew this would be a publishable paper. And that was basically as soon as we got the elephant data. The rest of it was just perfecting this figure. Um, this that, figure. Yeah, that figure. That's actually a figure in our paper. <laughs> um, regarding the scientific oh, humor. Could you raise your hand? Oh. Oh, there you are. OK, yeah. Regarding uh, scientific humor and tabletop experiments, do you think it will be easier for children to get more interested in science if instead of going through like uh, prepared experiments that show certain laws and why they are, uh, such as in physics experiments and otherwise, if they could have like these uh, making signs from junk and <laughs> doing like experiments that they uh, might also want to do in addition to the prepared ones. So the question is, if we replaced, how would children see it if we replaced these, you know, cookie cutter labs with, um, with, you know, things that are mildly pornographic, <laughs> like this? Um, you know, and I don't think it's ever been tried before. Mixing sort of biology and physics and putting into a physics lesson, and um, uh, you know, we're trying it right now. We're doing these online lessons um, called MIT Blossoms, where we we basically lead them through this and. Um, the first time they showed it to these high school, high school and middle school kids, they just went wild. I mean, they just, couldn't, they just fell off their chair. They're like, we get to watch urina urination videos in school? <laughs> well, I mean, I have a feeling when people are actually laughing, they're at least paying attention. And at least you have their attention. And that's really half the battle in school, is getting people's attention. And um, I, do think it has, I do think it has potential, um, basically mixing biology and physics and doing some things that fall in the category of gross science. So this is actually this docu new um, TV series on Nova. Um, they've asked uh, Patricia and I to contribute. Somehow, for some reason, they asked us to contribute the study to this idea of gross science, to get more kids involved in things that do not fall under textbooks, but could teach them some things. Maybe in 50 years, you'll see this in a textbook. But I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> it would be really weird, 2070. <laughs> All right, we got another question here. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I was wondering, do you, have you looked into whether or not this has any effect like on the circulatory system, whether the size of the blood vessel contributes to how fast it goes, through, like the blood circulates through the body, so then the urine would collect much quicker, or slowly, or? That's a good question. So the question is, does the circulatory system, does that affect how quickly urine is produced? And there are papers on the frequency of urination, and, um, and different animals actually produce they metabolize at different rates. Um, and so that wasn't, we kind of had to ask a simpler question, just when the bladder is full, how long does it take to empty? Um, but there are some deeper things that go on here and how this affects um, animal ecology and their life. Um, for example, there's this, I don't know if you've, anyone here from Norway, but there's a word called porncusima. It's literally, it means the time a reindeer can run, no, the distance it can run before it has to stop to pee. <clears throat> and literally- and it has the word porn in it. Oh, uh, poor N. I think oh, it's a sorry, Norwegian thing. Poor N, yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor N Kusama. And literally, this affected, like, you know, um, their rising, basically, their reliance on these reindeer for transportation. They actually noticed that reindeer cannot go this long, and they basically have to pee. So, we have to tell them that they have to stop. We have a question up there. Oh, yeah. One? And when sorry. All, and all animals run, when they urinate, they have to stop. I've been actually talking to this guy named um, uh, uh, Lieberman at Harvard who um, he's famous for uh, showing that people can run barefoot and still live, and actually maybe it's better for you. But he told me that basically all animals can run while defecating, but not while urinating. You have to stop. <laughs> you, you can't just keep on going. Try it at home. 
<laughs> Try it at home. <laughs> Try this at home. Ed, you have one there? Yeah, we've got one in the back here. Hi. So I just wanted to know, like, did you, during your experiments, did you feel that the outside, the ambient temperatures were also a factor? That perhaps if the elephant was feeling cold, he might be interested in getting to empty the bladder faster? Um, <clears throat> and the question is, um, did we do this in winter and summer, and did they urinate differently because of temperature? We did not do the experiment of woolly mammoth versus elephant and uh, urination time, but um, I, I don't know. There's a lot of strange things that happen in biology. For example, people have shown that frogs can't actually catch insects when it's cold. Um, uh, and same with these, uh, these uh, long animals, chameleons, because the cold actually makes their muscles not, go, not work as well, and the just, tongue just flops down. So maybe if it gets really cold, you'd be like Fazad. Three minutes. <laughs> All right, we have another question up here. We're going to have time for just a few more questions, but uh, you can always email more questions, right, David? Email? <laughs> email, it's come the same. Come to my office. Come to, anyone who wants to come can come to my office or email. Yeah. Uh, hey. Uh, so, any, are there, do you have any thoughts on, yeah, I'm oh, there. Victor, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on I extending your findings to underwater mammals or uh, how that sort of different environment might impact the time since there's the ambient water pressure? Whales. Oh, whales. How long does it take for underwater animals? So the interesting thing is underwater, you do not have the same effects of gravity. As you know, when you go in water, it basically defies gravity. It buoys you up. And in fact, animals, for example, fish, they don't have urethras. They just have a sac and a hole, and goes bleh. <laughs> the urethras evolved specifically, we think, for life above water, to allow the urine to not take forever as it came out. Um, so, and, and also, fish also urinate and defecate kind of at the same time. It's all bleh, all together. But that's another story. So, for fish, I think you would not get anything like this, because the, the, they don't have this urethra, um, and they're underwater. But for whales, I don't know. Um, if anyone wants to study like whale penises, or dolphin penises, or vaginas, just send me an email. We have, we have a, a, a Georgia Aquarium. And there's a support group for you. All right, uh, we got two more, two more questions. Ed, you got one there, and then I've got one here, and we'll call it a night. Okay. Hi, uh, so I had an interesting thought about Torricelli's law and how you said gravity seems to play a big role. Yeah. How would you envision, I mean, I guess, how do people on the space station pee if there's zero gravity, and what would you imagine a large animal, like taking a cow to space, how would that animal pee differently? What happens, oh, because the question is, so, well, the space question, they actually use a vacuum tube. They go, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have this, so the reason we have bladder pressure is so if you're lying down or in a headstand for some strange reason, but basically it's your backup pump. It will make fluid flow even if you're going against gravity. And so even without gravity, it'll flow. It just takes longer. Um, now, these large animals, what are they going to do? I, I don't know. I think we're going to need a, a stronger vacuum pump. And here's our last question. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, who said that? OK. Um, I was wondering if the age of the animal was considered when you were recording your findings, because Usually, if an animal is older, they may develop like prostate problems or anything that. May oh right, this is a good. This is a good question. And. Middle-aged guys in the front were wondering that too. Middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually get email all over the world from people who send me pictures of animals urinating, and it doesn't go into my spam folder anymore because I get so many. It goes into my inbox, <laughs> and um, I've had e people say that they've seen bison urinate for like three or five minutes in winter. Maybe it's a winter thing. Uh, giraffes urinate for three or five minutes. I mean, they're literally watching them. And um, it, is a, it is a known fact that basically almost all men that die either die of prostate cancer or have cancer growing in their prostate. Our prostate just gets cancerous. And when it gets cancerous, it gets big. And that has the effect of basically encroaching on the pee pee pipe, the urethra. It basically makes it smaller. And when you make it smaller, it's like less cars can go through. And you literally do, it does take longer as we get older. Um, and that could be one reason why this data is scattered. Um, maybe there are some old goats, literally, and um, old, the elephants were female, but old other an, male other animals that had particularly slow urination times. And that'd be an important thing to consider if we were to 
get the data right. And it's also another way that this study could be used to diagnose um, urinary problems in these animals. A lot of these problems, no one knows what is a healthy urinary system. And now we know that basically an elephant should take as long as we do. So what is unhealthy for an elephant? Now we know. Let's give Dr. Hu a final round of applause.